Glad you guys are all here this morning. We just want to open with a, a couple of announcements. Uh, the youth group will meet tonight at the church from 6 to 7.30. Uh, fellowship team, are you guys meeting today? Pauline, is the fellowship team meeting today? Uh, after the, the morning worship service, uh, the board will meet tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Uh, then also don't forget about prayer meeting at the church on Mondays at 9. Uh, we have the Latin services will be held Wednesday uh, at noon. This service, uh, this week's service will be held at the First Baptist Church in New Bethlehem. And Reverend Randy Hopper will be speaking, uh, followed by a light lunch in. Uh, also, Bob Schreckengoss is hopefully going to be here next Sunday, March 27th. Um, we will be uh, having a prayer at time for him. Uh, he was hit by a car a couple weeks ago walking down the, the street, and so we're going to have a, a prayer for him, and hopefully we'll get to see him next uh, next weekend. Um, also, we'll be hosting an Easter egg hunt here at the church on April the 10th, Sunday morning at 9.30, um, and if you can bring donations of candy for the eggs, they need to be here by April 3rd. Um, so, and we'll be hosting a Lenten service here at Leatherwood on Wednesday, April 13th at noon. The fellowship team is looking for volunteers uh, to help with meal and cleanup. So, uh, does anyone else have any other announcements this morning? Yes, Donovan. Okay, well, we'll remember that at prayer time, okay, buddy? All right, so we're, we're, uh, we're uh, just glad you're here this morning. Uh, we want to open with a, a word of prayer. Today is the first day of spring. Doesn't it feel like it? We have tomorrow is World's Down Syndrome Day, right, Donovan? Yeah. And so we got that to celebrate and all kinds of things happening. So uh, we're glad you're here this morning. Let's pray. Lord, we just ask that you would come and, and just bless us with your presence, the presence of your Holy Spirit. And Lord Jesus, we just ask that you would have your, your will and your way in this place. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you want to stand and greet someone around you this morning, let them know that you're, you're glad they're here today. Let's 
already received us in his. In my whole life it means forgiveness When I know I deserve the fall It caught me out of my darkness And carried me to the cross In a moment my eyes were open In that moment my heart was changed Like a blinding light in the dead of night It's the gospel Oh, and we can't live It's not freedom The open
Sam, I have a crazy thing I'd like to share. What's God been doing good? Yes, Donovan. You had surgery on your tooth. Yes. And did I hear mom had? No, no. he's the same. Just about that. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we have gone in for the surgery on his tooth. Yes, Tracy.
has gone, had his last treatment on Friday. And got to ring the bell as he went out of the place. So that's a, a wonderful thing. Yes? Um, that God let us all come to church today. Amen. Yes, Michelle.
remember that when their sounds are probably carrying up through the back staircase. <laughs> so how, how rare is it to find a selfless good deed? How rare is that? You know, of course, from time to time, we'll hopefully, as Christians, do good things. Are there Christians here that will do good things? One, one person. <laughs> as Christians, we are called to do good things, and and and, and we we uh, we we from time to time we'll see others doing good things. But these good things are often motivated by what we can get out of the situation, or what what can come from the situation and these encounters and. And, and, and according to the theologians of the 1990s, and I'm referring to the writers of Friends, selfless good deeds do not exist. And so go ahead and play the video and put back their voice.
it's impossible in your own strength to produce what it takes to perform a selfless good deeds. They have to come, they have to, to come from a source outside of our own nature. Because I don't know about you, but my nature is selfish all the time. Anybody else like that? And so as we're continuing in our, on in our series, Be a Disciple, Make a Disciple, we come to the topic of good deeds. And, and, and it tells us in the scripture that good deeds and helping the poor are to be a regular part of our lives as Christians, as disciples. And these things are also very rare. In fact, these things are as rare as seeing a lame man walk or seeing a dead woman come to life because they're in the same story. And if you don't believe me, let's take a look at a passage of Scripture. We're going to be reading from Acts chapter 9, verses 32 through 42. So Acts chapter 9, verses 32 through 42. This is what it said. As Peter traveled about the country, he went to visit the Lord's people who lived in Lydda. There he found a man named Ananias who was paralyzed and had been bedridden for eight years. Ananias, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and roll up your mat. And immediately Ananias got up. All those who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, in Greek her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. About the time she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. And Lida was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lida, they sent two men to him and urged him, Please, come at once. Peter went with them, and he arrived. He was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. And she opened her eyes, and, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet, and then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. You know, for as long as I've been a pastor, I've heard many sermons about he, the lame, being made to walk again. How many of you have heard a, a sermon about the lame being made to walk again? Okay? And I've heard sermons, you know, especially at Easter time, about people rising from the dead. How many of you have heard a sermon or two about people rising from the dead? But you know what? In this scripture, there is a third very rare thing that happens that's just as astonishing. Boys, can you bring up Acts chapter 9, verse, just verse 36? And it says this. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, in Greek her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. Always, meaning continually doing good and helping the poor. You see, why is it as, as, as people of God and as Christians, we talk about the lame man walking all the time and we give God praise, and we talk all the time about, about our God and how we can raise people from the dead. But as his disciple, this is just as important. Tabitha was a disciple because she was always doing good and helping the poor. So this morning I want to uncover what this means for us and how, how our life can look like this and how we can be about doing good and helping the poor. But before we go there, let's ask the Lord to, to bless our time together this morning. God, we just come and we bow down before you. And we ask for you to speak to us. To give us a message from heaven, directly from your mouth. And may it fill our hearts and our 
souls and our spirits today. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. So, yes. Oh, is it not turned on? It says it is turned on. Okay, I'll fix it. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Okay. All right. So I'll, I'll talk loud while he's working back there. But I have a quick question for you that should be easy to answer. Why did Jesus come down to earth? You can just yell out. Why, why did Jesus come down to earth? Save, save souls. Why, like, save the world. Okay. What else? Teach us truth. To teach us truth. What else? Fulfill the scriptures. You know, some of the things that, that, that Jesus himself or his followers, some of the reasons they gave for Jesus' coming was to seek and save that which was lost. That's found in Luke 19. Because of God's great love for us, God loved us so much that Ephesians 2, 4 through 5 tells us that, that he sent his son to come and die for us. It also tells us in, in Galatians, it says that, that sin had placed man under a curse and Jesus came to break the curse of sin. And in John 1, 12, it says to restore man to their position as child of God, that, G, that Jesus came to do that. And so these are all the words that talk about why Jesus came to earth. But there were these individuals, these prophets, who came along hundreds and sometimes thousands of years before Jesus ever walked to earth, and they gave a foreshadowing of someone who was to come and the reason behind his coming. And so two of these, of these most prolific prophets, according uh, to the amount of words that they have in the Old Testament, are the prophet of Isaiah and the prophet Jeremiah. And here are, are two scriptures uh, of, and what, of what they said that the, the Messiah, that Jesus was coming to do. And so the first one is found in Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3. And it says this, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, and to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the woe of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness. A planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. And then in Jeremiah, just going over to that, in, in chapter 7, verses 5 through 7, it says, If you really change your ways and actions and deal with each other justly, if you will not oppress the foreigner, the fatherless, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own heart, then I will let you live in this place. In the land I gave your ancestors forever and ever. You see, the, the words of both of these prophets have one thing in common. They're, consor they're concerned about the poor and the marginalized in society. And in fact, one of the reasons that Jesus is going to come back, according to Isaiah, is to proclaim the good news to the poor. And to get people focused on doing good toward them again. And this cannot be overstated because Jesus bursts onto the scene. And in Luke chapter 4, verses 18, as Jesus picks out a scroll to read, the first time he's in the temple, it, it comes up like this. Luke 4, verse 18, and you'll recognize these words, verses 18 and 19, says this, The Spirit of the Lord is on him, because he has anointed me. To proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. To set the oppressed free. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You see, Jesus is all about preaching to, ministering to, and reaching out to those who are poor. 
those who are marginalized in society, those who are often left out, and that's part of the very reason that he came to earth in the first place, according to the prophets and according to his own actions and words. And you know what this means as his followers, right? If we are going to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, then we're going to have to be about preaching the good news to the poor. We're going to have to be about binding up the brokenhearted. We're going to have to be about proclaiming freedom from the captives. To those who are poor in spirit, to those who are, are poor physically, to those who are, 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 have a poverty mentality. It's the reason, one of the reasons Jesus came. So as his disciples, disciples and followers, we cannot miss this te teaching. We have to be like Tabitha was. Full of good deeds and full of a willingness to give to the poor. So what does that look like? Let's, let's look first at the topic of good deeds. We are called as disciples to perform good deeds. So what does that calling mean? Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. I think this is, this is my, my favorite uh, verse on, on the topic. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. And this is what it says. For it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourself, it is the gift of God. Not by work so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You were created for this. You were created to do good. You are saved by grace through faith. There is nothing that you can do to earn salvation, but that doesn't mean you're left off the hook. You're not saved by your works, but you are saved to do good works. And that salvation comes through faith and grace, but that salvation also brings in it, and it brings up in us a need to do good things for others, a need to do the things that we're created to do. You know, James, the brother of Jesus, who was skeptical of his brother being the Messiah until after the resurrection, put it this way in James 2. After seeing who Jesus was and, and coming to terms with who he was, he talks about this topic as well. He says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is out clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, and if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. Again, I want to stress this. You are not saved by your good works. But you are saved in order to do good works. And last week we talked about how the fruit of the Spirit and, and how, how as disciples of Jesus Christ we need to bear this fruit of the Spirit. And one of the fruit of the Spirit that, it, that, that is birthed in us is the fruit of goodness. The fruit of goodness in which the Holy Spirit replaces our selfishness with goodness and a willingness and a wantingness to do good deeds for others. And we encourage each other and build each other up through these good works that we do toward each other. I want you to listen to the words of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 through 25. It says this, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. We are to spur one another on to good deeds and love. What does that mean? 
It means that we're to take the pointy thing in the back of our foot and kick people in the side in a loving way to get them to do good things. Why? Because we don't do it naturally. And so we need a little prompting. And so if you don't like the word spur, let, let's, let's, you, let's stir one another up. Some of, the, some of the, the, the translations say stir one another up. You know what that means? In, in the Greek it means agitate your neighbor. Agitate them. Do good works. Agitate them. Because once again, you will not do them under your own power, or you will not be drawn to them naturally. But this is our call. Tabitha was one who was filled with good deeds, and we need to be filled with them as well, even more so as we realize the times that we're living in. So we're called to good deeds as disciples, but we're also called... To help the poor. You see, the Lord always has a soft spot for those that society has pushed aside. So we can't go wrong if we're wondering, who do we do these good deeds for? If we can't, no one comes to mind. Who do we do? Find someone who is poor in, 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 in material things, poor in spirit, who is poor in, the, uh, uh, in, in every sense of the word, and help them. Let's bring up our scripture in Acts 9.36 again. There was a disciple named Tabitha. She was always doing good. And she was always helping the poor. And when this mentions helping the poor, it's specifically referencing giving of all. She gave of what she had to, the, to those who were poor around her. She invested in them and physically gave her money and possessions to those who were poor around her. And that means she spent time with them and she gave to them. Because the truth is, God does not play favorites. Think about the words of James and what he said in James 1.27, if we can bring that up. He says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself from being polluted by the world. James chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 says this, My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and says, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet, and be not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? God shows us through the word of James that faultless religion includes looking after orphans and widows. And this is a callback to what Isaiah was calling for. James wants to know that we need to steer clear of, uh, of favoring the rich in our church, in our culture, in our life. Because the rich people, they get enough attention from this world. So we focus our efforts on those who are poor. Poor in spirit. Poor in health. And take the hope of Jesus to them. I used to have this friend, and, and we haven't we haven't lived near each other for a long time, so it's been a long time since since I, I I've talked with her. But but she was a dear sister of Christ, and her and I would always get in arguments. She would always tell me, you know, God favors the poor. God favors the poor, and she would give me this scripture from Matthew nineteen. Let's bring it up here. Matthew 19, verses 21 through 24. It says, Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell all of your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. And when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, truly I tell you, 
It is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And she would read that to me and she would say, See, God favors the poor and so we need to favor the poor as well. And so I would always respond to her, Well, we know that God does not show favoritism or reverse favoritism. And that this story has much more to do with us than it does with the poor and the rich. You see, it's said that there used to be a gate in Jerusalem. And it was referred to as the Needle Gate. If you want to bring up this picture, there's a picture there of the Needle Gate. And you see, it had a, has a big door, that big metal opening there. And, and, and that was, during the day, that, both those doors were open wide. And so you and your camel and your camel that was packed down and all of your earthly goods, you could walk straight through this gate, no problem, no ducking, no, no issues whatsoever. But what happened at night was, because of, they didn't want just anybody coming into the city at night, they would close the needle gate. They would close the two big metal doors. And you see down there, there's only one narrow opening. A people door. And so if you came at night and wanted to get your camel through the eye of the needle gate, and the big gate was closed, it was just about impossible to do it. Do you know how the only way you could get your needle... Your camel through the eye of that needle. You would strip off all of your worldly goods from the camel. You would take all of your stuff off of the camel. And then the camel would get down on its hands and knees. And crawl through the gate. That's it. You would have to leave all of your goods. All of your possessions. Outside. In order to get the camel through the eye of the needle. That's what Jesus is trying to tell us. We hold on to all of these things so tightly. And as long as we hold on to these things. And just say these are mine. We're not going to get through the eye of the needle. That's why as his disciples we have to go. We have to have the humility to crawl in whatever direction he would send us and go minister to people. Not encumbered by our worldly possessions, not encumbered by our good deeds, but we are going to go and get off our high horses, or camels, I guess to speak. Get off our high camels and just go do good deeds and give to the poor around us. You know, as I think about my life, I think this epitaph on my tombstone would be a lovely thing. The same thing that was said of Tabitha. Doug Henry was full of good deeds and always doing good deeds. I'll take that. Because that's a life well lived. That's being a follower of Jesus Christ, and that's good enough for me. How about you? Can that be said of you in this life as well? Let's pray together. Lord, we come to you. And Father God, we want to be disciples. Lord, and to be disciples, we have to be unencumbered by all the things of this world. By every possession, every trapping. Lord, we have no hold over us. And Lord, may we live lives that are full of good deeds. And full of being able to help the poor. The poor in our communities, in our church. And the cities around us, Father God, may you make it our mission to preach the good news to the poor, 
to proclaim freedom for the captives. Lord, to those who are poor in spirit, bring freedom and bring the richness of the gospel to them. Father God, we just thank you and praise you and it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Stand as we close with the song this morning.
because these vets need this help. And you feel this big. And he said, this one gentleman came and asked him if he could have a pair of pants, if he knew anybody. And he said, well, I have, I have, I have two pairs of pants that are that size. I'll give them to you. Do you know how many pairs of pants that left, uh, that left Robert with? One. The pants that he was wearing. That's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. I've got more than I need. You take what, what you need. Do good and help the poor, and you will be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Be like Robert, and be praying for Robert too uh, this week, and Jerry, and, and, and Kevin, and the other uh, gentlemen we met under the bridge. Do something good this week.